Good evening, or good late afternoon. I uh, appreciate your patience. We had a little bit of a, a travel delay. It's great to see so many folks here. Really appreciate your, your attending today and, and hanging out on campus a little bit later than usual. Um, I do apologize for a slightly later start. Uh, our guest speaker, I literally just picked him up from the airport and dropped him off and got parked, and, and here I am. Uh, so I'm going to be relatively quick uh, with the introductions and, and thank you uh, this evening. As always, need to start by thanking the team here at the Graham Center for all the wonderful work that they do in allowing us to put on these programs and, and helping make all this uh, run from Marianne to Dorothy to the students, uh, Teresa, Kevin, Tim, everybody else. I uh, really appreciate your work. Also want to thank our sponsors and co-sponsors, obviously us, the Graham Center, uh, the Center for Jewish Studies, Director Norm Goda, thank you for, for participating with this. The Buddy Shorstein Lecture Series, which uh, is funded by Buddy Shorstein, who unfortunately cannot be here tonight due to another commitment, but he specifically created a speaker series here in the Graham Center, but with the intent of it, uh, you're bringing in speakers at the intersection of the interests of the Graham Center and the Center for Jewish Studies, where he is also you know, heavily involved. And so I think this was a, a great topic, uh, and I'm grateful for his support for it. So let me just say really quickly um, the origins of this. So many of you remember, will remember last fall the UF-Georgia uh, football game in Jacksonville. In the images, uh, the Kanye was right uh, imagery, the, the other imagery that was projected uh, in Jacksonville, one over the overpass on I-10 uh, and, and uh, some of the other stuff around the stadium uh, during that game and after that game. And after that happened, uh, I came into work that Monday and I, I had a conversation with Marianne who oversees our public programs and I said, I think we really need to try to do something on the rise of anti-Semitism. Uh, and so I sent Buddy Shorstein a quick email and said, hey, would you be, would you be good with us using your, your resources to support this? And he said, by all means, reach out to, to Rachel Gordon, who I'll introduce here in just a second, to try to uh, put something together on this. And so I'm really glad that we've been able to do th this. I think it's really, really critically important. This has been a rising issue of concern, most significantly, obviously, for members of the Jewish community, and I am not a member of the Jewish community, so I, I, I want to acknowledge that up front. Uh, and I can't imagine what level of concern this must be for them. I do want to say, though, also that this is critical to diversity and inclusivity on not only this campus, but in our communities and on all college campuses. And so when we think about diversity and inclusivity, we want to think about that in a lot of different ways and recognize the value of all members of our communities on our campuses. So uh, that's all I'm going to say. I'm going to introduce uh, Professor Rachel Gordon, who's going to serve as the moderator for tonight's event. Uh, Rachel Gordon is a uh, professor in the Center for Jewish Studies, and I'm not, because I don't have, I didn't have time to get my notes and everything from my office, I'm going to end it there, and I'll let her do her own uh, further introduction. I do apologize for that, but given the circumstances, Rachel, please, and thank you. Welcome, I'm Rachel Gordon, and I teach in the Department of Religion and the Center for Jewish Studies. Um, this evening's event, as Matt was saying, is sponsored uh, by Jewish Studies and the Graham Center through funding uh, made possible by the Samuel Bud Shorsting Endowment. Um, and we're also featuring a display from the Anti-Semitica Collection at UF's Isser and Ray Price Library of Judaica. So if you didn't get to see it before the talk, um, you can see it after. The Price Library holds over 300 pieces of anti-Semitic hate literature. The materials include books, newspapers, pamphlets, and flyers in English, German, and Spanish dating from the 19th century to today, basically. Uh, while some of these materials are from Europe and South America, the bulk of the collection was printed in the US. The nine items that our Judaica librarian, Dr. Rebecca Jefferson, has chosen for the display here demonstrate how anti-Semitic themes and images that originated in a European context were recycled and augmented for American audiences from the late 1800s to the present day. Um, so it's, it's been four years since the Pittsburgh synagogue shooting added a new line to American history textbooks. 
In fact, um, I remember from the weeks and months after the October 27th, 2018 shooting, receiving emails and seeing social media posts from colleagues in Jewish studies and in American history classes where, where friends were asking, wait, am I right to call this the deadliest attack on American Jews in history um, in a way that seemed, it seemed almost hard to believe. Um, well, it was the deadliest attack on American Jews and those feelings of shock and confusion that this was happening in our times um, is part of what we're here to discuss. Um, our guest, uh, Mark Oppenheimer, is a former religion columnist for the New York, New York Times, the author of five books, including his most recent, Squirrel Hill, The Tree of Life Synagogue Shooting, and The Soul of a Neighborhood, and a creator and host of the wildly popular um, podcast, Unorthodox, um, and the creator and host of another interesting podcast called Gate Crashers, The Hidden History of of Jews in the Ivy League, um, which I was delighted to be a guest on this fall. Uh, he's taught at Yale and Stanford and other schools, um, and for 15 years was the director of the Yale Journalism Institute. Uh, so I want to welcome Thank you. Mark up. So good to be here. Um, so I don't know if after writing the Squirrel Hill book, um, which by the way is on sale in our uh, bookstore, um, I don't know if you thought you were done with anti-Semitism <laughs> then, um, but uh, it, you know it turns out you weren't. And this this past year, or if, even just this past fall semester, right. has been very eventful in terms of anti-Semitism. In fact, I was teaching a, a Jews in popular culture class here, and we had you know, novels and films that I think my students found really engaging, but they kept bringing the conversation back to a different Jews and popular culture issue, which were the, the celebrities' right. remarks about Jews um, during this fall semester. So just to refresh our memory, this was Dave Chappelle, it was uh, Kanye West, known as Ye, Kyrie Irving, um, promoting conspiratorial thinking about Jews. Um, so I'm wondering, to, since you've written some about this and you've spoken about it on your podcast, um, what you think about this kind of celebrities anti-Semitism, is this important? What does it mean? Right. Well, one of, well, first of all, thank you all for having me, and I'm sorry that I was, I, I think I arrived at 5.01 exactly. I left Hartford at 4 a.m. and uh, <laughs> spent a, a lovely day in Charlotte. Um, so it's, it, but it's a, a real, real delight to be here, and um, I'm excited to, to do an hour with you and then hang and talk to whoever wants to talk afterwards. It's just a real, an honor uh, to be at the Graham Center. Um, so, you know, one of the interesting things about anti-Semitism, it is true that after, after spending a year and a half commuting back and forth to Pittsburgh and writing this book about the deadliest anti-Semitic attack in American history. There was some sense in which I thought, uh, at least for me professionally, it's time to do something else. So um, I wanted to do something that had nothing to do with death, nothing to do with sadness. I mean, I, I, I went looking for, uh, for projects that were going to be a little more, a little rosier, a little cheerier. Um, and yet, I knew on some level, of course, anti-Semitism, at least for scholars, is a gift that keeps giving, as bleak as that is to say, right? That, um, as you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a couple thousand years old. You might say 3,000 years old. But, um, and one of the interesting things is how it mutates, right? And, and in this regard, it is, um, I would say, not worse, not better, but different from other kinds of, of bigotries or, um, or pathologies that in different times and different places, you know, Jews are hated either because they're too communistic or because they're too capitalistic, because um, they're too sneaky and, and reserved and cunning or because they're too pushy, uh, because they're too much the friends of the rich or because they're too much the friends of the poor, right? So the, the interesting thing about Jew hatred is how it mutates into any conceivable possible form. So I don't think it's surprising that given that we live in what seems to be kind of the apex of celebrity culture, right? Even more so than 10 or 20 years ago. Um, because social media has given every celebrity and many non-celebrities um, platforms of their own, right? Um, it is not surprising that it has also become the latest mutation of anti-Semitism. 
And so one of the things I always say about these celebrity anti-Semitic eruptions is, if you think back to 20 or 30 years ago when we were children, if you were a celebrity and you, you know, Mel Gibson's been saying crazy anti-Semitic stuff for a couple decades now. When he started out, he might be able to say it on the Today Show or Good Morning America or Johnny Carson, and then they wouldn't have him back on for a year or two or three, right? You, if, if, if there was a way in which the system of network television and um, the media kept a, a lid on it a little bit, because if they thought someone was going to go off script and say something horrible or hateful, that would offend a lot of their audience. They just wouldn't have that person back on. And then that person didn't have a platform for the, in the next year or two or five. Now, of course, the TV shows and the media ecosystem are irrelevant. They have their Twitter account. And so it's given everyone a direct, a direct line, a kind of permanent uh, bullhorn to say these things. And that's a way, that's the latest mutation. And, and yeah, it's tremendously concerning. The um, Canadian writer Morel Silkoff, I think mm -hmm. the New York Times, wrote something, it really caught my eye about how it feels like anti-Semitism is trending now, moving from something that was verboten to something that is widespread in the culture. Um, it's still, I mean, I, that, that felt true. It still feels like we're talking about anti-Semitic incidents, which is, um, which is heartening that I think of the period that I'm often studying, sort of the, the 30s and 40s, it really was then more in the air people bre breathed. And, and now at least, at least we still, we're still always surprised. And it's, um, I, I think it, it is more discrete incidents like that. I mention this because I notice people want to draw connections or distinctions between our era and say the, the 30s. Right. Uh, you know, people are often asking, is this like 1939? Um. Is my microphone on, by the way? Good, excellent, because you know I can hear myself. I, I'm always loud to myself. Um, you know, I think one of the great mistakes we can we can make as historians mm -hmm. and 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 as thinkers and as just human beings trying to figure mm -hmm. out the world is to make false and overly committed analogies. Right? This is just like this. Like, of course, this place we're in right now is not like Munich in 1933 or Berlin in 1939 or Israel in 1967 or 73. Right. Two things are never exactly like each other, and it's probably going to actually harm our analysis if we make it too much like something else, if we reach for the simple analogies. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, uh, and nobody in this room I think is old enough to remember it, but of course in the 1930s, Father Charles Coughlin, the anti-Semitic radio priest, was able to fill Madison Square Garden with 20 or 30,000 committed fascists, mm -hmm. uh, you know, chanting about Jew hatred and how the United States shouldn't oppose Hitler and urging everyone to kind of align behind the, the fascist forces of Europe. I mean, we are nothing like that. Today, we rightly get angry if there are a couple hundred crazies in Charlottesville. He had tens of thousands of people in Madison Square Garden mm. in the late 1930s. So mm. is this like the 1930s? No, of, of course not. And it's a little bit silly to think that it is. To me, the interesting question, the analogy I reach for, having just told you don't do analogies, <laughs> I'm going to reach for an analogy. The analogy I reach for is England. England today, yesterday, 20, 30 years ago. Anti-Semitism is a very interesting character in England, which is it's almost never violent. I mean, in the past, you go back about 500 years, there were pogroms. But say for the past several centuries, it is almost never violent, mm. but it is almost always present. That is to say, the thing you're talking about where it's kind of trending, where we worry that it's becoming a little bit OK to make, you know, for kids to make cracks about Jews or, you know, use Jewish slurs or use Jewish stereotypes on the playground or on a college campus, that's the kind of thing that we think doesn't come to America. Mm -hmm. That's kind of always been the case in England. It's always been the case that if you grow up Jewish in England, you'll hear somebody make a joke about you know, how Jews are obsessed with money or Jews are sneaky or one of the stereotypes. These people almost never feared for their lives, but they learned to live with a certain low-level cultural suspicion of Jews. And I think that could be where we're heading. Mm -hmm. I think we could be heading to that place. Mm -hmm. Not, you know, I don't, having written a book about mass murder, I don't think we're headed to, our pl to a place of mass murder. Mm -hmm. I think that will remain exceedingly rare on a probability, you know, s seen through the lens of probability. Could we be heading toward a place where Jews, where my children are more accustomed to hearing anti-Jewish comments than you and I were? Mm -hmm. I think we could be. Yeah, I often think the period we grew up in sort of the decade-ish when we were in college as a kind of golden era for American Jews um, around the turn of the century. There are all these new Hillels at all the top universities. Um, 
I guess. I often say that like the 80s and 90s were peak Jew. <laughs> That's my term for it, <laughs> which is in terms of both the number. So, and I'm often talking about college campuses yeah. because of, of this podcast that, that we worked on together. That in terms of the numbers of Jews who are on college campuses, in terms of their visibility, in terms of the college's support for them, mm. and in terms of the general goodwill, the mm. idea that Gentiles would happily walk into the kosher kitchen or the Hillel and go to a party there and think that was a, a fun, cool place to be, that, that the 90s, say like 95 to 2000, 2005, was, was peak Jew. And it was worse before and it's been worse since. And I guess the, the other side of that British scenario you're talking about is it always seems to me that they are, they don't live out loud as Jews in the kind of robust way. I mean, because right. they are, they're used to hearing these kind of comments. And I, I think that is the, the current fear um, that anti-Semitism will, uh, will keep Jews from, from living all the joyous things that are part of being Jewish, yeah. which is... Go ahead, sorry. No, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, the, you are absolutely right. Mm -hmm. I'll, just, I'll just say that you're absolutely mm -hmm. right, that when you, when you meet British Jews in America, they are often amazed at, at the confidence with which American Jews talk about being Jewish. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and it's, it, I think it's also one of the reasons we're sometimes hesitant to have events like this. I know my colleagues in Jewish studies elsewhere and here um, have a, a twinge of discomfort, you know, that, that this is what we're talking about um, because there is so much more to being Jewish, of course, and yet if, if you're a non-Jewish student on a campus like, like this one, meeting Jews, many of my students are meeting Jews for the first time, uh, this is what you get to know about Jews, that they seem to be obsessed about anti-Semitism. Um, and you're, maybe you're not even sure the degree to which that's a valid concern. Uh, so anyway, there, there's, that, there's that discomfort with even planning an event like this. I, you know, it's funny because I don't plan events. I, right. I just go to them. I just eat the food and drink the wine. Um, but as, it, it fills me with a little compassion for, mm -hmm. for people, you know, my, my fellow, you know, former colleagues in academia who stayed in academia and, and do plan events like this. I understand that, right? Mm -hmm. On the one hand, it's an important event to have. On mm -hmm. the other hand, I can imagine exactly what you're saying, which is you feel that the Jewish face you're presenting, at least for that event, is one of worry, worrisomeness and fear. I, just to, to go off that, I noticed recently um, that the literature I get from my alma mater, I went to Yale for, for, for college, and so I, I still get the, the mailings from Yale Hillel, and of course, they're now emails, of course, and they often are these wonderfully designed things with lots of embedded photographs, and they show the students at the Purim party, and they show the students lighting Hanukkah candles. And I've noticed they started identifying the students by first name, last initial. So whereas in our time, they would have said, you know, there's Rachel Gordon and, you know, Bob Goldberg and, you know, Jimmy Schwartz lighting the menorah. Mm -hmm. Now it'll say, there, you know, lighting the menorah in December at the Slifka Center, Shoshana H and David R mm -hmm. and Kevin C. And it drives me mad um, because I feel like, now I assume it was a decision made to protect them, mm. that there was someone weighing risk who, who thought, we don't want to put their names out there as public Jews. Mm -hmm. you know, they can choose to do that, but in our grown-up literature, in our fundraising literature, we don't want to put their names out there as Jews, which is just a thought that would have crossed nobody's mind in 1996 or 2000. And... Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm I'm the kind of person, unsurprisingly, who dashes off angry emails to you know, <laughs> to <laughs> for no reason at all except to kill time. And you know, my form of procrastination, in addition to binging TV, is dashing off angry emails to my alma maters. And so, I was almost ready to write to the old rabbi and say, "Why are you not identifying these young leaders? Mm -hmm. If someone's president of the Yale Jewish Student Union, like name that person mm -hmm. and 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 honor her or him." And and they're not, but then I thought, well, they may feel that this is protecting them. So it, it, that really brought home to me in a very kind of small way mm -hmm. the, how the world seems to have changed for this moment. Yeah, I, a colleague recently told me that a grown child, was move, they were moving them into an apartment, and the parent said, oh, let's get a mezuzah. And the child said, I don't know that that's such a great idea, wow. which, I mean, I'm, I'm not surprised, but wasn't something ever crossed, I think, our minds at, at that 20-something year 
And at every, on every Hollywood TV show, you've noticed there are mezuzahs on the doorways, right? <laughs> have you noticed, have you ever mezuzah spot when you watch TV? Because, <laughs> so for those of you who don't know what a mezuzah is, which pr probably 90% of you do, but it's a, a little scroll of, of scripture that you put in a little decorative case and put on the doorway of a Jewish home. And one of the interesting things that, if you're ever watching TV closely, because so many shows are shot in, in you know, they don't actually build a set every time they shoot someone on a TV mm -hmm. show at a home. They often rent homes in greater LA. And when they're renting Jewish homes, they don't take the mezuzahs off. So you'll often see a scene on, you know, whatever, The Wire or, mm -hmm. you know, you name it, TV show X, Y, or Z, to, you know, the latest uh, Tom Clancy thriller. And there'll be a, a, a house that's supposed to be of a Catholic family in Vienna, and there'll be a mezuzah. <laughs> and that just means they rented a Jewish household in Beverly Hills to shoot the scene. <laughs> so, but yes, you're right that I think there is a sense, I hear from students at the various places I've taught, you know, I'm tucking my Star of David into my shirt now more and mm -hmm. more. And, and then there's a sort of a reaction to that. I mean, we just had a jeweler on our show the other day, this wonderful woman uh, who, who is making Star of David rings, and they're selling like crazy mm -hmm. because there's been a pushback from people who say, actually, I do want to wear my Judaism proudly. So, but, but again, it's a conversation that wouldn't have happened 10 or 20 years ago. One of the ways you bring this up, uh, actually just about a year ago, um, you had an article in the Wall Street Journal titled, The Growing Risk for Jews Who Show Their Jewishness. Um, I was thinking of this because I mentioned to you when we were chatting this week that that one of my brothers is modern Orthodox, so I've, I've always thought he walks around very differently because he's always worn a kippah. The other brother is less religious, but he started wearing a kippah when we were in public high school, again, at a time when that nobody thought that was dangerous. Right. Just sort of interesting that he yeah. decided to do that. Um, but um, you, you wrote in it, that these lines really caught me, you said, the recent heightened antipathy towards Jews hasn't been focused on the general Jewish population, rather it has targeted the shrinking minority of Jews who regularly do Jewish things in Jewish spaces, go to synagogue, for example, or shop at kosher markets, for Jews who Jew it, to use a friend's favorite locution, even the very occasional synagogue attack, while statistically insignificant, makes every religious service a little more tense. And then you say to, I think, really helpfully restore perspective, you say, on the other hand, for people who are Jewish but don't do Jewish things, the U.S. is less oppressive than ever. Fifty years ago, there were still meaningful prejudices and structural obstacles that plagued the most secular, non-affiliated Jews. There were country clubs that didn't allow Jews or only a token few, and there were law firms and Wall Street banks where making partner was that much harder for a non-Christian. Um, so this this really caught my attention. I'm curious when, when you were sort of clued into this difference. Yeah, so that's a, that's a wonderful question. Um, I think this occurred to me because I was, I mean, obviously it's something I've been thinking about since working on this Pittsburgh book is, you know, the, that the risk of being Jewish only visited these people when they went to synagogue. They got killed because they were doing Jewish, right? And again, contra you know, in, in Germany in the 1930s, they would come to your house and smash your house down and drag you off and steal your stuff and smash the windows of your, you know, even if you weren't religious, even if you weren't trying to be publicly Jewish, that's not happening here. Here it's visiting Jews who are going into Jewish spaces, a JCC, a synagogue, that got, wearing a yarmulke in public. Um, but it, it occurred to me that the flip side, mm -hmm. right, that actually if you don't publicly do Jewish, mm -hmm. things are better than ever. Because periodically at our podcast, we will get an email from someone who will say, how come you never talk about restricted country clubs? Mm -hmm. By which they mean country clubs that don't allow Jewish members. And I began poking around about this, as, you know, put on my journalist hat. And I don't think there are any restricted country clubs left. Um, I think that there used to be restricted country clubs, but I think it's been at least a couple decades. Since, certainly there is no evidence that there is a single country club in America where Jews have tried to become members and because they were Jews, or most likely because they were Jews, they were rejected. And it seems to be, an, or at this point, live on as an urban legend from previous times. So that's so interesting. Okay, so interesting you said that because I was thinking of the same thing yeah. recently. Yeah. And you, prob you probably landed on this too, but there was a 1962 Sports Illustrated article about country clubs and they actually were talking about Mark and I kind of grew up in the same area. So they were talking about this Western Massachusetts area where we're both from, and they were saying this is a really good place to understand what's happening with country clubs because there is the Longmeadow Country Club, which is where the Wasps live. Gentile, right. yeah. And then there is um, 
uh, I think it's called Crestview, they said, is the Jewish country club, this is in 1962, which is the most lavish, and that is just for the Jews. Um, and then there was one in Ludlow, I think, where Poles went, they said, um, and maybe the Springfield Country right. Club. But they didn't, they did not use the language of, um, you know, restricted or not allowed, in part because they were talking about, they were also naming that this Jewish Country Club was the most lavish. So again, Jews did not present as victims because in 1962 they are already, you know, solidly yeah. middle class. I think for a long time, right, even then, I didn't know about this article, but I have to go find this article. It sounds amazing. I think even when there was a sense of the Jewish club in town and the Gentile club, as you point out, mm -hmm. it was it, it persisted in part by just custom and choice, mm -hmm. right? Right. And there were probably Jewish members of the Longmeadow Country Club, and there were probably some Gentile members of Crestview. Mm -hmm. um, now, of course, all country clubs are struggling to survive. I mean, unless you're Augusta National, your average country club is, is hemorrhaging members. Golf, golf hours are way down. People are, you know, largely because people just watch TV and, like, do online gambling. I mean, the, the, the idea of joining places to go out, be outside and be, do healthy outdoor stuff has taken a big hit in America, even before COVID. But um, so, yeah, the, it occurred to me, and I did a bit of research on this, though not, I, I, not deeply enough, that, um, that basically you can make partner in any law firm if you're good enough, that basically you can join any country club. There's no more real restrictions. And I always issue a challenge when I write this stuff or talk about it on my podcast. If you have counterexamples, send them to me, and no one does. Mm. So if you just want to join American mainstream cultural life or professional life, it's never been better. Mm. And yet, all of a sudden, if you want to actually go to synagogue on Saturday or drop your kids off at a nursery school that's housed in a Jewish community center, it's quite scary. Mm -hmm. And I've just, we've never seen this kind of yeah. dichotomy before. Right. I guess the other flip side, I think you deal with this too, is that for those loosely affiliated Jews and the ones who don't, you know, look visibly Jewish is they often, or sometimes they have less Jewish knowledge or literacy. So in a sense, they are, um, in danger of being hurt the most. Cause if it turns out that, that we are in very anti-Semitic times, they have, nothing to fall back on and the the mid 20th century american rabbis that i write about um who are writing in the late 30s and 40s are are talking about this that it's our jews who don't know anything who if all they know is that people hate them well they don't have anything to feel good about so they're sort of in spiritually or emotionally psychologically they are in the most trouble mm -hmm. um whereas these very religious jews at least know they know something about their heritage they they still have you know, something to go to that's positive. Yeah, they know what they're being attacked for, yeah. and they know why it's worth doing it anyway. And I think that's right. If all, I think you just put it very beautifully. If all you know about Jewish mm -hmm. is it's, a, it's the reason people are mad at me, that, that's, I think that's very psychologically damaging. I mm -hmm. think that's right. So we mentioned at the start some of these recent uh, uh, celebrity uh, anti-Semitic comments that were made this past year. Um, you wrote this wonderful book um, that is about an event that some of our audience might not remember or might not have known about. I wonder if you can um, you know, remind us what this shooting was. And I'm also going to ask you, Mark, if you might read the beginning for us, oh, since sure. I think it's a great start that will sort of let people know. Absolutely. So in October 27th, 2018, thank you for letting me borrow my book. Um, October 27, 2018, a gunman walked into the Tree of Life Synagogue, which was a synagogue that also housed two other small synagogues that rented space in their basement. So it was three congregations. Can I stand up so I can see everyone here? OK, so this gunman walked in, and he, um, with an AR-15 and a lot of ammunition, and shot up the place. And of the 22 people inside, half of them, 11 of the 22, uh, were killed. And a couple others were injured but survived. So half of the 22 people inside died, all of them Jews uh, at worship, and the other half, which included one Italian-American custodian, survived, got out alive. So 11 dead in the span of about an hour, the morning of October 27, 2018. The deadliest anti-Semitic attack in American history, one of the deadliest attacks uh, of all the mass shootings in American history. The FBI now tracks mass shootings because since Columbine in 1999, there have been something like four or 500 of them. And they define a mass killing as any killing in which more than three people are murdered at once. They've actually had to create a category of mass killing because we've become the country of mass killings. Um, so, um, so Tree of Life in Pittsburgh immediately became this sort of the worst day for, for American Jews on American soil. I began trap, it's, it's where my father's from. He's from Squirrel Hill, which is the neighborhood in Pittsburgh where Tree of Life is. Uh, my dad grew up, it wasn't his synagogue. 
but he grew up about a half mile from it. And uh, so I had a lot of connections in town. I still have aunts and uncles who live in Pittsburgh, and my family's been in Pittsburgh for about five generations. Though again, I grew up in Western Massachusetts. So I, I thought I should write about this, and I began traveling to the Squirrel Hill neighborhood uh, over the next 18 months, right up until COVID descended. Uh, I was there 32 different trips, interviewed about 250 people, and I wrote a book about how a community responds. So I was not interested in the murderer, and I wasn't actually even interested in the murdered, although I think they were obviously wonderful people who, who, uh, who probably each deserve a book of their own. But what I was interested in was the way a community expresses its resilience in the aftermath of a mass killing, which I think is something that all communities need to think about, whether Jewish or of other minority uh, descriptions or just people who, have, who are suffering. Right? We all have to think about how can neighborhood build resilience? How can we help each other in a time like this? So sure, I'll, I will read what are, I'll read what's no doubt like the bleakest couple pages of the book. And then you want me to show some photographs from that it? That would be great. Okay, so, uh, and then maybe we'll open up for, photo for questions, but I'll, I'll follow your lead. Mm -hmm. The book, by the way, is actually very uplifting because it really is about people coming together and cooking for each other and knitting for each other and helping each other. So I do always, although I, it is important to start with the beginning, I always kind of, it's a misleading beginning because the book's not about what happens here. Just before 10 o'clock, the morning of October 27th, 2018, police cars, a SWAT team, multiple fire trucks, and a fleet of ambulances converged into a serpentine caravan that sped into the Squirrel Hill neighborhood of Pittsburgh, the sirens shredding Saturday's early calm. They were responding to 911 calls about a shooter at the Tree of Life, the synagogue at the corner of Shady and Wilkins Avenues. Sirens aren't unusual in Squirrel Hill. It's not a violent neighborhood, but it's densely inhabited and alive. The houses, the grand ones and smaller ones, attached dwellings and apartment buildings, are on small lots without much margin of green at the edges. People hear their neighbors and know each other's business. There are shops, big and small, and traffic, and young people and old people. And with them come grease fires and heart attacks and the small misfortunes of a thriving urban village. Plus, there's 18 Engine, the firehouse on Northumberland Street, which takes calls not just from Squirrel Hill, but from other precincts in the east end of town. So there are sirens. But this morning, there were, as local residents would later recall, an unusual number of sirens. Tammy Haps lived only two blocks from Tree of Life, but she did not hear the sirens. In 2014, tired of her job as a technology executive at NBC in New York, she moved to Pittsburgh to spend a year studying local history. Among other things, she wanted to research the history of the synagogue her great-grandfather had founded in Homestead, the former steel town just across the Monongahela River from Pittsburgh. By 2015, after spending a year in the archives, she'd expanded her research to include other defunct synagogues and the bulldozed houses around them and the family trees of long dead Jews. She joined a synagogue, made friends, and became something of a macher, a big shot, in her adopted neighborhood of Squirrel Hill, which had remained substantially Jewish, unlike surrounding communities that had lost their Jewish populations. Squirrel Hill had been the heart of Jewish Pittsburgh since the Great War. That morning, Heps was planning to go to her synagogue, Beth Sholem, less than a mile up Shady Avenue from Tree of Life. She always went to synagogue on the Sabbath, but like many Jews, she often rolled in well after services began. A 9.30 a.m. start time might mean a 10.30 arrival, followed by 90 minutes of worship, and then a leisurely table-hopping lunch in the social hall. But on this particular Saturday, Heps slept late. She was in the shower when the sirens were going by, and she didn't hear a thing. As she was toweling off, she heard her iPhone beeping up a storm, as she later told me. She paused before checking her text messages. Although she had grown up with a liberal reform Judaism, and as a child had attended synagogue only on high holidays, she'd become more traditional as an adult. She was not fully Sabbath observant. She still used her laptop on Saturdays, turned on and off the lights, and did other things that were technically prohibited. But she'd been trying to use the phone less on Saturdays to quiet the hum of technology one day a week. As the phone kept beeping, she thought, this is not normal. She grabbed the phone, looked at the glowing screen. My entire screen was people saying, I'm OK, I'm OK, she recalled. I was like, why are you telling me you're OK? She scrolled down and saw a text from her mother. Please call synagogue shooting in Pittsburgh. Mm, thank you. So I end up following Tammy through a lot of that day as she ended up encountering the sirens, the shooters, and some of the people we'll see in these photos. Do you mind if I go right to the yeah, photos? So this is the cover of the book. 
I'm going to take you through just through 12 photos, about 30 seconds each. This is the cover of the book, and it shows a kind of um, memorial garden that was formed spontaneously outside the synagogue building over the next 48 hours. What I like about it is it has flowers, which are a tradition Christian funeral accoutrement, but not Jewish. And then it has candles, which are a Jewish symbol of mourning. Jews light candles in honor of the dead. So spontaneously, without any planning, it had become an interfaith site of healing, with the, the, the Jews leaving candles and a lot of Christians leaving flowers. One of the people Tammy met was this guy, Greg Zanus. Some of you might have known about him. He died in 2020. His obituary was in the New York Times and on all the network TV shows. He was a, a, an evangelical Christian who traveled around the country bringing crosses to uh, mark the spots where people had died of, of gun violence. But one of the cool things he did was, if the victims weren't Christian, he, he, you, he put on the front of the cross the symbol of whatever faith they were. So even though these are crosses, and this is not him in Pittsburgh, this is a different photo, he ended up putting Jewish stars, the six-pointed star of David, on the front of crosses in a way you'll see in a minute to make, to make it a more Jewish symbol. Who here has seen this, this, this uh, mashup of the Pittsburgh Steelers logo? You raise your hand if you've ever seen this before. So only about a, a quarter of you. So this is, if you know football, you can recognize this is a riff on the Pittsburgh Steelers logo. But instead of the yellow element at the top, uh, the sort of yellow diamond, they've replaced it with a yellow star of David. This was created by a Protestant guy, a, a Lutheran, German-American named Tim Hindus, uh, who lived in the Pittsburgh suburbs, wanted to do something for the Jews of Pittsburgh. And so he sat down. He was a graphic designer. He thought, what do I do best? I design. That's what I have to give. Everyone has their gifts. Some people bake. Some people sew. He said, I'm a designer. I want to do something for the Jews of Pittsburgh. So he took the ultimate Pittsburgh logo, the Steelers logo, and he made, he Jewed it up by, by putting in a Star of David. And then he put it on Facebook and said, anyone in the world can download this for free. I don't want any money. I have no copyright. And millions of people downloaded it. The Pittsburgh Steelers wore it on their cleats. Uh, they printed it on babies' onesies, on yarmulkes, on bibs, everywhere you can imagine. And it's, it's on posters throughout Pittsburgh now. Um, this, you can't really quite see it, but the headline is in Hebrew. Uh, it's the headline of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette on the Friday after the killings. The editor of the Pittsburgh newspaper decided to print the first line of the mourner's Kaddish, the prayer that Jews say for the dead, in Hebrew, Yitgadal v'yitgadah, Shemei Rabbah, um, on the top of the paper. What's so cool about this is the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette didn't have a Hebrew font, so they had to create one. They built one from scratch that night so that they could print this comforting line in Hebrew for the whole city, most of which, of course, isn't Jewish. But even if you didn't know what this meant literally, you kind of, you kind of got the idea, you know what I mean? Um, this is the Starbucks. Every community has a Starbucks at the heart of it these days, right? Because it's America, 2023. So this is the Starbucks at the heart of Squirrel Hill at the quarter of uh, Forbes and Shady. Any Pittsburghers here, by the way? Wherever I go, there's always one Pittsburgher. This might be my, my first Pittsburgh-free audience ever. <laughs> I've become a magnet for Pittsburghers. Wherever I go, the Pittsburghers show up. So pit people from Pittsburgh know this Starbucks. Um, this is amazing. They did pub Again, you know, the, the manager of it, Melissa Lysot, is Presbyterian. She didn't know from Jews. She didn't know about Hebrew. She found an artist who could do this, um, who learned how to do this Hebrew lettering. They put a Star of David and a Tree of Life and a dove from the story of Noah and the Ark in the window, all these Jewish symbols. And they put the words love, uh, hope, and I'm having trouble, love, kindness, and hope, um, ahava, chesed, and tikva in the windows. And it's still there. Starbucks is leaving it in this, these windows forever. Um, this is the sign on the, the off the highway, just the entrance up to Squirrel Hill. Somebody has hung, you can't really see it too well, but a blue Star of David, a handmade Star of David from the H, just to say this community is welcoming to its Jews. This is a funeral procession on the Tuesday after the killings. And what's interesting is you see a bunch of Orthodox Jewish men walking behind the hearse. Why is that interesting? They're Orthodox. None of the dead was Orthodox. The Jews who were killed were conservative or Reformed Jews or Reconstructionists, more liberal strains of Judaism. But the whole community, including the Orthodox, turned out to help them mourn. It's also important because to have a proper Jewish burial, there's a tradition called tahara, where they wash the body according to certain very ancient customs. And they needed as many hands on deck to wash the 11 bodies as possible. So the Orthodox community helped wash the bodies. Um, they also, by the way, one of the traditions in Judaism is every part of the body has to be buried. So if you've been killed by gunfire, and some of your flesh or bone is embedded in the walls, for example, or on the floor, they try to scrape it up and give it a proper burial. And that is something the community of Jews in Pittsburgh all did while Gentile allies helped secure the building, while the guards were outside, while the police helped them get
gave them space to work, while the mayor, who's Italian-American, Bill Peduto, helped support them as best he could. It was a, a massive interfaith effort. Um, this is Shai Khatiri. He's Iranian-American. He's the largest single fundraiser for the Jewish community of Pittsburgh uh, outside of the, the largest non-Jewish fundraiser for the Jews ever. He's Iranian-American. He, he was mortified that this happened. He thought this is something that would have happened back in Iran, but not in my adopted country of America. And he started a GoFundMe campaign that raised a million and a half dollars in about a week for Tree of Life and the victims and their families. The night of the shooting, a bunch of teenagers organized a, a vigil, a Havdalah ceremony. Some of you will know what Havdalah is. So the Sabbath starts Friday night, and Saturday night when it ends, you have a different ceremony called Havdalah, which means separation, separating the Sabbath from the rest of the week. And you light Havdalah candles. And these teenagers said, we should have a Havdalah and honor the victims. And the grown-ups said, we, we need time to plan a big memorial. We're going to do something tomorrow on Sunday. And the teenagers said, no, we're doing something tonight. They met at that Starbucks. It was an interfaith group of teenagers, mostly women, mostly high school senior girls. On the left is Emily Pressman, who's Jewish. On the right is uh, Isabel Smith, who's black uh, and Christian. They got together, and they planned this event that had thousands of people turn out at the corner of Forbes and Murray, uh, holding up candles or probably cell phones with their flashlights on, right, and, and honoring the dead. President Trump came to town, which is very controversial for a lot of people because some people felt that his rhetoric had maybe played some part in the, in the culture of hate. This was, some people felt we have to welcome the president and ought to, some people felt we must not. The rabbi who's on the right, Jeffrey Myers, uh, whose congregation was attacked, ultimately decided hospitality is the supreme virtue, so he greeted the president and the first lady. But the most important thing in this, in this picture is you can see this, remember we talked about the crosses for losses? the wooden crosses and how he put a Star of David on the front of them. So that's what you're seeing in the front there, is the crosses for losses with Stars of David on the front. Uh, it's a bunch of people at the anti-Trump rally. Thousands of people turned out. Uh, one person held up that sign. I always show that just to show both the depth of the feeling, but also that it was the one sign like that. It was not, it was a very peaceful rally. And in fact, um, only one person was arrested. So you think of thousands of people turning out at an anti-Trump rally, you might think there would have been violence or fighting. One arrest, Josh Bloom, he was a sociology professor at the University of Pittsburgh. He was arrested um, for sitting down in front of Trump's motorcade and blocking traffic. He sat down, he started chanting and praying, and he was released the next day. And he, he said to me, the police were very nice about it. They cleared me out. They treated me gently, and then they didn't press any charges. Um, one of the interesting things about the aftermath of a mass killing, and this goes to some of the things Professor Gordon was talking about, about you know, the role of Gentiles and Gentile allyship, is that a lot of Gentiles do stand up. And so here's Tom Hanks, um, who is you know, in some ways like the most popular man in America. <laughs> right? At any given time, we can't necessarily agree on the president, but Tom Hanks, who doesn't love Tom Hanks? And here he is with his arm around uh, Joanne Rogers, who's the widow of Mr. Rogers. Um, for those of you of the Mr. Rogers neighborhood generation, as Rachel and I are, um, Fred Rogers was from Squirrel Hill. Uh, he spent, well, he, he wasn't born there, but he spent his adult life there. He created Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood in Pittsburgh and the neighborhood that he had in mind when he wanted to create uh, a, a fictionalized version of a, a safe, secure neighborhood where children could play freely was Squirrel Hill. He looked out his window and saw Squirrel Hill. So there's something very poignant about this happening to literally Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Um, the, the, the big head of white hair in the middle, do we have any football fans who can identify from behind whose big, robust head of white hair that is? Yeah? It is Robert Kraft. It's the owner of the New England Patriots. And I just think, like, what better sign of sort of collective support for the people of Pittsburgh and the Jews of Pittsburgh than that the, the owner of the arch rival, AFC rival, New England Patriots, went in town, went to pay his respects at Tree of Life Synagogue, and even wore the Pittsburgh Steelers yarmulke. Right? Even wore, like, when in, when in history has the owner of the Patriots worn any Steelers garb only in the aftermath of the Tree of Life killing? Uh, two final photos. One of the very, very moving things was the amount of people who brought their therapy animals and, and support animals and support dogs to the scene of, the, of what happened in the days afterwards. I talked to a woman who drove eight hours with her, her therapy dachshunds. And I'm a dog lover, so I would have happily written the book just on the dogs of Pittsburgh and happily put photos of dogs, but my publisher said that's not the book we signed you up for. <laughs> the, the, the readers of the world might want something more than Oppenheimer's refle reflection on the Jewish dogs of Pittsburgh um, and their Gentile dog allies. And, but, 
but this is a girl stopping to pet a dog the day after the killing. And the dogs are, you know, the one behind it is wearing the red support animal vest. And she's holding a note that she wrote for the police of Pittsburgh. She's on her way to get to the police station to give them a note that says, thank you for keeping my people safe. And I just want to conclude with this photo. I always conclude with Robert Zacharias. He's this nice dude from New Jersey I met in my first weeks in Pittsburgh. He grew up in a very non-observant home. He's Jewish, but not particularly religious. Why do I include Robert Zacharias? He's wearing a yarmulke in this photo. You can't tell because it's not the back of his head. He sent me a photo of himself holding out a challah that he was very proud to have made. And it is a beautifully braided challah. But his story was that the night of the killing, he went to that vigil and he decided to wear a yarmulke, a kippah, a head covering, just to show his Judaism, even though he wasn't someone who typically wore one. And the next day, he got up and he thought, well, the whole world is still in mourning. I'm going to put it back on my head. And the next day, he wore it again. And the next day, he wore it again. And when I met him a month or two after the killings, he was still wearing a yarmulke. Not an Orthodox guy, not a particularly religious guy. He just wanted to stand up and be counted um, as a Jew. And to me, that just ended up being the story of, of, of Squirrel Hill. You know, when I say it's a happy book, it's actually a book about resilience. To me, what was so interesting about it is that in America, right now anyway, when something like this happens, it is both the worst kind of thing that can happen, but then you also see the best kind of people and the best kind of response. So you not only see Jews who are standing up for the first time and saying, look at me, I'm proud to be Jewish, and I'm going to wear this head covering, even if it puts me at risk, but you also see people um, like Lynn Hyde, who was a Christian woman I met who'd always thought about converting to Judaism, and when she heard the sirens going by her house in Pittsburgh, and when she turned on the TV and found out what was happening, she decided at that moment, I have to go through with my conversion to Judaism. I feel like those are my people being attacked. Like That clarified for her what she needed and wanted to do with her life. I'm also thinking about people like Rose McKee, an African-American Christian from outside Minneapolis who has a tradition of baking sweet potato pies for people who have suffered because she says it's a cuisine from her tradition and she wants to give it to people in other traditions. But here's what's amazing about Rose McKee, and I want to end by talking about Rose McKee for 20 seconds, if you'll bear with me is she had this idea, as she was baking these pies, she had this notion that Jews keep, co quote, keep kosher. She knew that Jews had special dietary laws. And it occurred to her that baking pies for Jews wasn't as simple as baking pies for Lutherans or Catholics, or you know, that, that, that there are Jews who wouldn't necessarily eat pies from her kitchen if she was also baking, had pork there, or had an unkosher oven, or whatever. So she went, there's an older woman, older black woman, who had never really interacted with the Jewish community. And she went to the Jewish elementary school in the Minneapolis suburbs and said to them, I, I want to bake pies for Jews. Do you have a kitchen where you could show me how? And they said, sure. And they told her what ingredients to buy that were kosher. And they told her how to cook them so that they would be kosher. And so for the first time in her life, she baked kosher pies. And she then mailed them to Pittsburgh and then flew to Pittsburgh to be there when the pies got there so she could greet the pies and bring them to tree of life, and eat them with people who had lost friends or family in the shooting. So to me, I, you know, I'll just speak very, very personally from the heart. Like One of the amazing things about writing this book was that, again, it, I had never been so close to anti-Semitism in my life. I grew up never facing anti-Semitism. I, I literally can't remember ever facing it growing up in Springfield, Massachusetts. And here I was immersing myself in the worst case of it in American history, and yet, I also found that at this moment in time anyway, in that city, and I think this is true in American cities you know, across the country, the real story is that the fund of people of goodwill, who, who not only from that town, but from other towns, and the way that they converge and, and make a difference. So that's just to say, like, the story is complicated. It's not easy to write in, on one page. Uh, it doesn't submit to easy historical analogies. And what it also means is that it's like open to all of us to keep writing the story. That, that in fact, because it's not written the way it was in Germany in 1938 or 39, it's, it's up to us to decide like, what, where the period goes and what, what the next chapter looks like. Thank you. I'm glad you brought up that non-Jewish response. I think I remember the, the Shabbat after it was a bunch of non-Jews went to synagogue in communities all over the country. And when people try to make that connection or say what we're going through now is like the 1930s or the 1940s, that non-Jewish majority culture response, which is so important, it, it means so much to, to Jewish communities, is the difference is that I, I think most of us Jews really felt like 
you know, non-Jews are with us in this moment. Um, I think we're, we're ready to go to your, your thoughts and questions for Mark. Um, so we'll, we've got, okay, great. Yeah, what can I tell you? <laughs> can you hear me? Okay. Well, first, I want to thank you so much um, for speaking to us, as well as everybody here for facilitating this event. My name is Naomi Rosenberg. I'm a student here at UF, and I actually was born and raised in Belgium and left because of the rising anti-Semitism. In Belgium? In Belgium, wow. yes. So um, having grown up in a place where I couldn't sing Jewish songs in the supermarket, I couldn't go to public school because we had family friends being beat up by their own classmates for being Jewish. Um, it was definitely great to see the response in America from our allies and communities that aren't Jewish. Um, so you sort of touched upon it by saying that you don't see the potential of mass murder, but you do see that potential that to me was the reason I had to flee Belgium. Mm -hmm. um, so my question to you is yeah. how do you see both the Jewish community and other communities being able to continue the efforts that we've seen in the past weeks, in the past month, to continue yeah. combating anti-Semitism. So I'm just going to stand up again, just so everyone can, can see me, and because I'm a Nancy person who likes standing up. Um, so uh, first of all, I have to tell you, if anyone listens to this podcast we do, Unorthodox, about Jewish life and culture, one of my co-hosts, Liel Leibowitz, has this, this running joke that Belgium's the worst country in the world. Um, I've never been to Belgium, and I have nothing against Belgium. But he just—he sort of always looks for stories about things going wrong in Belgium. So I don't know if that's—if you have enough Belgian pride left that that bothers you, or if you're like rooting it on. But I just want to say, like, he would be in solidarity with you for you know, like what you suffered in Belgium. Um, you know, I have actually a very—I always have two answers to this question. One is obviously as a as a person, as a guy, as a dad, as a friend. I don't have a great answer. You know, like no one's ever solved the problem of hatred. <laughs> right? Smarter people than anyone in this room have tried and not succeeded to solve the problem of hatred. It seems to be very much embedded in, in who people are, right? So theologically, we could say this is the fall in Eden. Like this is this is what happened in the garden, is we became bad. And um, so I don't have high hopes for, but. But that said, our job is, you know, our job's not, as we see in Judaism, the job is not to finish the task, but we're not free to desist from it, right? So uh, I, my answer is always to, I have a quick answer to Gentiles and a slightly longer one to Jews. To Gentiles, you know, don't ever put up with anti-Semitism. If you hear anti-Semitic jokes, if you hear someone slur Jews, if you hear someone say the kind of thing that people say when they think the group that's being attacked isn't around, you can't stand for it. It's as bad as saying terrible things about Black people, queer people, disabled people, Latino people, it's bad. These things are bad. And Jews count too, that Jews are people. That's it. That's very simple. So that's what allies have to do. Um, what do Jews have to do? Jews have to keep doing it, uh, as, as I say. I mean, the, the job of Jews is to live full, robust, proud Jewish lives, whatever that means, whether it means praying Jewish, cooking Jewish, partying Jewish on Jewish holidays. Um, just putting a mezuzah on your door and representing. I mean, whatever it means, it means we, as in, until they're coming for us, right, until it becomes physically dangerous to do so, and I would never tell anyone to endanger their lives, but as long as it's not physically dangerous, then the job is to like live proudly and robustly Jewish, and I do think that makes a difference. I think it gives people resources to not, because look, what do I tell my children? The advice I give my children is not how to change society. It's how they can thrive. Like, right? I'm, not, I'm not there to tell them how to change society. If they become change agents, that's up to them. But as a dad, what I want is for them to thrive. How can they thrive? They can thrive by knowing who they are and, and being joyous about it. So like, I think that the motto for every Jewish day school, every Jewish elementary school, should just be like joyfully Jewish. You may or may not get out knowing perfect Hebrew or knowing Talmud or knowing this or that. But if you get out feeling joyfully Jewish, you've won. So I think like that's that would be my message to you. Thank you. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, you're right; it's not the 1930s. Um, but the one thing we can say about the 1930s is that the anti-Semites owned up to being anti-Semites. They they said all of this stuff about the Jews is true, and therefore I'm a proud anti-Semite. 
Now it seems, and this is one thing that strikes me as different, we don't even really have consensus on what the definition of anti-Semitism is. And it goes beyond you know, how far you can go on bashing Israel until you cross the line. There's also a sense that if I say it and it's true, you know, Kanye was right, then I'm not an anti-Semite. And, 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 you know, and so in the 1930s you have it, it's true about them and therefore I'm an anti-Semite. And now we have it's true about them and therefore I'm not. And it's the only, uh, it's, 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 it's maybe the only form of hatred where we simply can't agree on the definition. And I'm wondering if you can speak to that. Yeah, so you know the old, the old British joke that anti-Semitism is hating the Jews more than is absolutely necessary? Yeah, um, so, it's just an old British line, right? Um, you know, a little Jew hatred is of course socially necessary, but hating them too much, is, you know, that's uncool. Um, you're right, there's no, there's no consensus on the definition. And I don't have a good one myself, but I'm not, I'm not sure why it's so important, right? I think, I, you know, I, I take your question seriously, and I'm just, I'm just going to sort of turn it this way and say, well, I think obviously, in a sense, we, we want to be precise and clear and know when people are, um, are speaking with integrity or, or out of goodwill and when people are speaking in bad faith, and that's an important thing to think about. For me, um, as a Jew and also as a journalist trying to figure out what's going on in the world, I've never found it particularly helpful to interrogate people's motives too deeply, right? Because the truth is we never know. What we know are their actions, right? I actually don't, I'm not interested in trying to cure people's, in, in trying to purify people's hearts. If there are people who are anti-Semites who are keeping it to themselves, I don't really see that that's my business, to be perfectly honest. Like, we all have dark thoughts. We all, we all think ill of people whether based on race or ethnicity or just, just unkindness in ways that we shouldn't. We're all overly judgy and overly cruel. And, but the job is to tamp that down and to keep it to ourselves and to try to do better. So I'm not particularly interested in the question of interrogating people's motives down to the last, you know. Th the question isn't why was this person banned from the country club or not banned. But the question is, if you're in 1950, let's say, why is it the country club has no Jews? It's not, it's not about blaming this person or that person or that person. It's just saying, we have a social fact here. The, the structures are such that one group seems to be treated unfairly. What can we do about it? So I guess I'm much more interested in asking if there are Jews who feel troubled, what's troubling them and how can we fix it? I'm really less interested in the anti-Semites. You know? I don't want them to colonize my thinking. You know, they, I don't owe them that. And as a journalist, I don't think I can figure them out. That's the other thing. Yes. Um, I was hoping to, uh, that you would tell us why this is happening. And so far I've just gotten uh, that um, a bunch of sort of crazy celebrities, uh, most of whom are black, have come out saying these things. Um, Not Mel Gibson. I talked about him. He's a white Australian oh, yeah, Catholic you're right. guy. Yeah, Mel Gibson. There's a proud tradition of white anti-Semitism, rest assured. Okay, okay. <laughs> like, um, Anti-Semites come in from every group. The Germans were very white, but yes, go ahead. I mean, uh, between like the late 90s and the present. So you want, me, you want some analysis but, of why? But let me just ask you a question. Yeah. Um, is it part of the sort of the same uh, division that's happened in this country uh, between the people who lost their manufacturing jobs and are pro-Trump now because they feel that the country's changing and getting worse and worse? Is, is it part of that whole... Uh, scenario or so but I grew up in a Jewish neighborhood I'm 82 years old I'm a practicing Christian I don't understand any of this frankly so I want you to yeah you want me to solve the problem to solve it for you sure in 30 seconds yeah um, okay uh, so I think there are a lot of things going on in times of great social dislocation these bigotries do rise to the surface right a bad economy is never good for feelings about the Jews there are always people who in a bad economy blame it on the Jews some will be white some will be non-white um, some will be practicing Christians, some will be kind of pagan American materialists who are just interested in video games and sports, which is the religion of most Americans, right? Um, so uh, yes, the economy has something to do with it. Uh, Anti-Semitism is also cyclical. One of the things that happens is in, in a country like America, when it gets very bad, there then tends to be a kind of a, a blowback of shame. And so after World War II, for example, the 1950s and 60s were much better for Jews than the 30s had been, partly because the world was ashamed about the Holocaust. 
So then what happens is after a while, people forget the shame, and they forget the genocide, and then the anti-Semitism comes back. And then people say, whoa, too much anti-Semitism, and then it dies off. So anti-Semitism is sort of like a sine wave, and it can be very, very cyclical. But the other thing I would say, if you want, if you want to know why it's worse now than 15 or 20 years ago, or say the recession of 2008, which was a far worse recession, I think social media, when I start talking about it, I get very, very boring because I start ranting like a crazy person. But the myriad ways in which it's made our culture worse and our individual lives worse cannot be overstated. And, abs and look, every example of contemporary anti-Semitism people are talking about, with the exception of Dave Chappelle's peer appearance on Saturday Night Live, but the others are all social media related. They're all either about pe posts that people put on Twitter or Facebook or content they shared on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram. So if you take the social, if we went back to newspapers, we'd have a lot less anti-Semitism. Now, we're not about to go back to newspapers. I understand that. But for your analysis of understanding the world and, and its troubles right now, you can, you can definitely start with the fact that people, that there's so many unmediated ways that, um, that angry people can reach other people with their poison. And that's just new. That's just not 1980, 1930, 1500, the year zero. This is new. To um, add to that, I completely agree with, agree with you about the social media. I, I can't ignore the, the change in um, you know, the last presidential administration. You know, we, we did have a president who I think was very comfortable kind of speaking in stereotypes, um, whether it was you know, Mexicans, immigrants, Jews, women. Um, and that, uh, you know, sometimes that showed up as philo-Semitism from the president. Sometimes it looked like anti-Semitism. But suddenly it became sort of normalized to say Jews or Mexicans are this in a way that, you know, that wasn't as okay before. So that normalization, um, I think, did happen. That there, you know, we, we did notice a change in those years. I think that's true. I mean, I think... Yes, and, and I think it's, cor it's coarsened me. I feel a little more comfortable stereotyping than I used to. It used to just be like, you just didn't talk in stereotypes. It was just crude. And I think Americans don't feel it's as crude anymore. I think that's exactly right. Wait, I think there's a couple microphones going around. So I want to honor those people, and I'm sure we'll get to you. Hi, yeah. uh, I'm Jordan Bachner. I'm a student here at UF as well. I was wondering with the most more recent events with like Kanye West or Kyrie Irving, yeah, uh, that where when those events happened, the kind of response was take away uh, sponsorships, take away their accounts, which then led to the reaction of, oh, here are the Jews again, you know, silencing them, they, you know, kind of reinforcing what they were touting that we control the world, we control right. the media. How would you respond to that and, you know, to avoid kind of reinforcing the negative well, things that, you know, right. they're... First appreciate. of all, um, you can't control what anti-Semites say. It's not, it's not the job of anyone to worry about, oh, they're going to say this if we do this. Because you go down that road, look at the Jews having, you know, putting up a sukkah in their backyard. They think they could just build a hut, you know. Look at them lighting all their candles. I mean, anti-Semites are going to get, find any reason. You can't, you can't go around trying to please the anti-Semites or not give them ammunition. I don't believe in living that way. Oh, so that's number one. It's a great question, by the way. Number two, why is it the Jews taking away his sponsorships? Like, Gentiles are taking away his, like, well-meaning Gentile allies run Nike. And, and you know, the, the idea that, that if stuff is happening to him, if, if he's suffering penalties, the Jews did it, that's a failure in our collective imagination. It should be that all people of goodwill did it if they don't want to buy products endorsed by him anymore. So that's, that's the right message is, you know, well, you didn't, Jordan didn't take away, his, you know, presumably, corporations run by people, most of whom are Gentile, made these decisions. But the third thing I would say is, you know, it is a kind of crude calculus whereby anti-Semites say dumb things, then they lose sponsorships, then they apologize, then they have to go visit the Holocaust Museum to show that they've truly atoned. And it's all just very transactional and very dumb, and I'm not sure it makes anything better. I mean, I think that what we have to do in our own lives is stop caring what celebrities think. Because you know what? They are not, some of them are profound, deep thinkers. Most of them are not. They're good at the things they're good at, right? And we shouldn't expect thoughtful, discerning, kind, compassionate commentary from people just because they're paid a lot of money to make movies or play sports or sing songs or whatever. They might be brilliant at those things. That's not a qualification to have a meaningful opinion on anything, right? And, you know, my daughter was saying to me, you know, there's a period where 
where a number of very famous models were, were tweeting horrible things about Israel. And I said, you know, and she was quite upset and her friends were retweeting it. And I said, I said, look, I, I, I can't, I have no idea how to console you on all this except to say, isn't it sad you live in a culture in which people care what models think about Israel? <laughs> and like, the fact is we're all broken that way. We are all broken, me too. I, me too, I, am, I include myself there. We all turn to these tastemakers and influencers and celebrities to tell us what to think about Ukraine or Israel or reproductive rights or whatever when we should be reading people who know the subject, who know more than we do about it. And, it, and like, if you get anything out of an education at a fine university like this, it should be the tendency to go seek out people who have done the work and know more than you do rather than people who just happen to have a very strong brand. Hi, I just want to say thank you for speaking today. It was very enjoyable. You bet. Um, I would say, in branching off of um, his question, on a more personal level, in regards to the Kyrie Irving and Kanye West situations, I grew up Jewish, but I also grew up a very big fan of basketball and hip-hop as well. You grew up Jewish and basketball-ish. <laughs> yes. And exactly. hip-hop-ish as your but, religions. I understand. Um, yeah. My question to you is, on a personal level, maybe for you or whatever, um, at w to what extent do you separate the artist from the art and the player from the play, or is there right. no distinction? Uh, you know, it's funny. I, my daughter, who's a huge NFL fan, was for a while, had deleted the NFL app from her phone because of so much countenancing of partner and spousal abuse by NFL players. And she just said, I can't be a football fan in good conscience anymore. And then the next season, I noticed her you know, talking with a friend of mine. I don't follow football, but she does. So she talks to my adult male friends about football. And she seemed very knowledgeable about you know, the AFC championship game or something. And I said, I thought you weren't following football anymore. And she's like, yeah, I caved. I had to follow football. It's just, it, the, the app is back on my phone, right? So I mean, nobody should feel bad for the art they love. I feel that very profoundly and deeply. And if the art is the three-point shot, or if the art is a particular song, or if the art is a novel, or a Wagner opera, or whatever it is, even if it was produced by an anti-Semite, I actually think we're entitled to love the art that we love. And I don't think we should be ashamed of it. I don't think we should feel guilty about it. Obviously, there's important thinking to be done about where we put our money, where we put our dollars. And I think that's an ethic. We should all think ethically about what we spend money on um, and, and, and who gets our money. But if there's a passive way you can consume uh, art by terrible people that makes you feel good, uh, I'm all for it, actually. And I don't think it does a lot to curb anti-Semitism for you to deny yourself the pleasure of listening to a song you really enjoy. So, but at the same time, it also provides opportunities for, you know, educating people. You know, so, I mean, I would never, if my daughter were a big fan of Ye, I would also hope she would know and be able to talk about why he's a problematic person. You know, and I think we don't want to be dumb consumers of art. But I, I think, look, I think that's what it is to be a sophisticated grown up is to be able to hold two thoughts at the same time and say, on the one hand, this is an amazing song that he created with an extraordinary level of genius. On the other hand, he believes some incredibly dumb, poisonous things. Those two things can be true in a person. And I, I don't see a problem with holding those two truths. That's a really good question. You'll tell me when to shut up, by the way. I'll go all day, but you know, you're know, you the boss. So. All right. I, I'm sorry for interrupting. That's OK. I couldn't see any microphones. We all forgive you. And thank you for being here. And my question is, you brought up a couple of times that uh, uh, the curation of things. You know, from earliest times when we had books, there were editors. Mm -hmm. And then when we had radio, they were under the FCC and had regulations about what they could put on. TV followed the same thing. But when we got to social media, we decided that that wasn't a good idea and freedom needed to be more absolute. Would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, yes and no about editors, right? Anyone is always free to publish a pamphlet. And if you look at sort of how the American Revolution happened, the history that we know and that you know historians like Professor Gordon and, and others teach in American history is often the history of freelance intellectuals self-publishing and handing out stuff on street corners. And that's a great American tradition. So um, you know, it's not the case that it's always been mediated. I think there's also a tremendously important difference but, you know, in, in who does the mediation. I, I'm very much against government censorship. I think they're very, very rare in specific cases. Confidential war secrets, for example. There's certain kinds of classified documents. Things related to, to children, so court proceedings that involve minors. There are cases where I support some sort of government restraint on what can be published. But generally, I want the government out of it because I don't trust them to be any smarter than, than I am on it. Um, it, you know, the question people are often asking is, shouldn't Twitter be censoring all these people? And um, I actually think no. Um, 
That's not your question? No. Do you, Oh, I mean, they do have liability. So here's the thing. We actually have laws that say, now, if you slander the Jews broadly, <laughs> you're, actually, you're actually on probably fairly safe ground because you have not slandered an individual. So the, the libel and slander law are pretty interesting there. But certainly, I mean, if people slander or libel an individual, they can be sued and they should be sued. And we have, and we have laws that, that, that work. So I, um, you know, the, the loophole is that if you slander a billion people or you know, in the case of Jews, 12 or 13 million, um, you're on safe ground because you haven't specifically slandered any one of them, which is a weird, you know, uh, a weird loophole, that it's safer legally to slander a whole people than it is to slander Bob. Um, I don't see a good answer to that. I mean, I value free speech. I'm where, I think the cure is always going to be worse than the disease. Um, I think we, we have to live with it and be smart about it. Um, so... So I hate to do this, but I'm, I'm getting the signal um, that we're, we're going to end this part of the evening, but we really hope the Graham Center in Jewish Studies is, is hosting a reception because we want to give all of you a chance to talk with Mark and meet with him. So we will be on the second floor for that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh,